Well, hi, Adam. I'm, uh, my name's Jim Mellon, and uh, I'm the chairman of Juvenescence, which is a company involved in uh, the science of longevity. Uh, it's relatively recently formed. It's about a year and a bit old, but we've raised a significant amount of money, uh, nearly 160 million US dollars now in the last year to advance the cause of, um, of longevity science. And by the end of this year, we'll have made uh, 18 investments. Uh, most of them are subsidiary companies of ours, so we control those companies. Uh, and we give backing, uh, both financial and development backing, to the scientists, entrepreneurs, and institutions that we collaborate with. Um, I've got fortunate to have uh, two partners who've got broad experience in the biotech and healthcare area, um, and in particular, Deck Dugan, who was the head of um, drug development at Pfizer for a long period, and then he became the CEO of Ameren, which, as you know, is a very successful biotech company with nearly a $10 billion market valuation today. Uh, and then about four years ago, the three of us started a company called Biohaven, which is now listed on the New York Stock Exchange, has a valuation of about two and a half billion US dollars, and has an approvable drug for migraine, which will be on the market in the US next year. So there's a good team of veteran drug developers and business entrepreneurs who've come together to create this juvenescence company. And we're very, very excited about it. We're the biggest investors in the company ourselves on the same terms as other investors. And we will take the company public in the first quarter of next year, barring you know, market disasters or whatever, uh, and probably on the US uh, stock exchange. What was it? What, what was it triggered your interest in this? Why, what, why do you um, put so much energy in? And how, how have you raised so much money? So what was the motivation to get into this? Well, we've been in biotech, as I said, for quite a long period of time together, um, created a number of companies. Uh, and it seemed to be a natural outcrop of the great developments that have occurred in, in the last few years. So the unveiling of the human genome identified uh, aging pathways that can now be manipulated. So for the first time ever, you and I are in the cohort on the planet that is able to be bioengineered to live a healthier uh, and longer life. And uh, it's, we're still very primitive stage. We're in the internet dial-up of our uh, equivalent, um, but the science is advancing very quickly. And I always say that I wrote my first book on biotech seven years ago. It was called Cracking the Code. And since then, we've had CRISPR-Cas9, didn't exist seven years ago. We've had the cure for hepatitis C. We've had artificial intelligence for the development of novel compounds, which is a key part of our strategy as investors in, in silico medicine, which I think you're familiar with. Uh, and then, of course, you've had cancer immunotherapy, which didn't exist seven years ago and is now a hundred billion US dollar a year industry. So what's going to happen in the next seven years, we don't know, but it's going to be very, very good. And so we're trying to put our, if you want to regard it as a, as a sort of casino table, we're covering all the markers that we can with the funds that we've raised. And we'll raise a, hopefully a substantial amount on the IPO or the initial public offering of the company in the first quarter of next year. And that will give us enough firepower to do five phase two trials without partners so that we can um, get the maximum leverage on the products that we're developing. So far, we've invested in uh, small molecules, which is the specialization of our team. And we have a, for instance, we have a uh, senolytic drug in development in that area. We've also invested in stem cells. So um, I believe that you've talked to Mike West and uh, his company were the largest investor in, which is now a public company in the US. We own about 46% of that company. Uh, and then we've also got our first product going into patients in the first quarter of next year, sick patients, so phase two, uh, for organ regeneration, regenerating the liver using hepatocytes to seed uh, lymph nodes to act as ectopic bioreactors to grow fully functioning livers. And the FDA has uh, agreed to the protocol of doing that in sick patients, which is a remarkably fast path to demonstrating successful outcomes in, in that area. And then we'll look to regenerate, if that's successful, other organs, in particular the thymus, which as you know is related to aging in a big way. So we're moving very, very quickly. We've got great uh, colleagues. Margaret Jackson from Pfizer is on our team. Howard Federoff, ex of Pfizer as well, is on our team. Anna Lisa Jenkins, who is the head of uh, drug development and research and development at Merck Serona, a very big drug company, is on our team. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've put it all together remarkably quickly, but we have experience of doing that. And so we're full of confidence. This is a remarkable time to be alive. And I want to be alive for at least another 20 or 30 years beyond what would be considered to be my allotted lifespan. And the same is a motivating factor for my uh, co-founders, Dick Dugan and Greg Bailey. Excellent.
Um, so it's interesting um, that, that there's a lot of causes out there, um, but it seems as though to many people here, they're arguing that like uh, anti-aging research or can I say longevity re or rejuvenation research has um, such a cumulative high impact for people today, but not only today, but in the you know decades to come. It seems like it's an ethical thing to do. What are your thoughts? Oh, definitely. I, I think that no one can argue successfully at least, that this isn't a good thing to do. Um, there are some people who say, well, it's for the haves and not for the have-nots, and that's rubbish because ultimately all these drugs will become generally available, and some of them already are. Metformin, which as you're aware, is a drug that um, is, uh, has some anti-aging properties, uh, is cost nothing. It's a very generic drug, and uh, in the same way as antibiotics and ulcer drugs and so forth were once expensive and now very cheap, the same thing will happen to uh, drugs for um, uh, longevity or anti-aging and uh, gene therapy and stem cells is another matter that's probably going to be an expensive thing for some time to come but undoubtedly the cost curve will come down for those as well the other people who argue against this area talk about overpopulation if there are all these old people um, you know will there be enough room on the planet well the answer is we're already alive so we're not going to be um, adding to the population because you and I Adam are here the big issue on population is how many children does each woman have around the world, and that figure is falling dramatically to the point where we can see populations actually shrinking. And just as an example, if Japan doesn't allow immigration or it doesn't allow or doesn't have a baby boom, uh, its population will fall from 126 million people today to 50 million by the year 2100. So both those arguments, one that it's for the for just the haves versus the have-nots, and the second that it's going to lead to overpopulation are, are nonsensical arguments. So in my view, there is absolutely no reason why governments, institutions, the general population, the voting population shouldn't be pushing really hard to make this happen. Another issue related to the population is that there is an increasing ageing population and there doesn't seem to be anything but um, around to deal with that except you know, targeted disease interventions, uh, palliatives in a sense. But it seems as though if we can get this going, that could help solve some fundamental issues that drive downstream, which will reduce the likelihood of the occurrence of downstream diseases. Yeah. Well, you've said it very well, and I can't, I can't add to that. I mean, this is Aubrey de Grey's great point, is that if you, talk, if you treat the top cascade of aging, and other eminent scientists as well, uh, then you're going to treat the underlying diseases of aging that the pharmaceutical companies are currently trying to address. But you know, there it's a whack-a-mole, because if you get one disease and that's cured, you'll probably get another one, and then they'll have to cure that one. And ultimately, you become destabilized and we die, all of us. So let's try and treat aging as the central disease, and from that, as a unitary disease, we'll be treating the underlying cascade that follows from that. Often people say that it's hubris that's motivating this research. How do, how do you Well, I think that's partly because until relatively recently, the nothing worked in, in uh, anti-aging. You know, it was a, it's been an aspiration of human beings for millennia to find the fountain of youth or the elixir of youth, and that nothing's worked. So if people are skeptical about the fact that it might be working now. Why is it now rather than 20 years ago or 20 years in the future? The fact is that it's now and we need to seize the moment and, and rise to the challenge. And uh, we need much more money to come into this area. Money will drive the science. Uh, and we need many more advocates for this, such as yourself or Aubrey, to come to the fore and to spread the word that, you know, this is going to be monumentally great for human beings. Uh, in my own case, I've set up a, a charity with um, Andrew Scott, who wrote The 100, 100 Year Life, and we do a longevity week in London. But we did the first one last week sorry, last year, and we're doing the next one in November of this year to spread the word that, you know, this will have a big societal impact, patterns of consumptions, the way in which we look at the trajectory of life, uh, but it's also going to have a major impact on us as human beings because, you know, in the past you would have expected to live to about 85 or 90, the same with me, and now we're very likely to live to 110 or 120, so let's do it, let's get, let's do it, let's, let's make it happen. Yeah, well, I think all of us, yourself, myself, have relatives, dear friends, uh, acquaintances who are suffering the indignities of aging as it currently exists and would like to relieve that burden and suffering by extending healthy life 
or healthy span of life, basically. And that's what uh, I think that's a, the personal motivation is a very big factor. You know, here in Berlin, there are three or four hundred people at this conference, and I imagine all of them have an uh, beyond just the business side or the scientific side have an altruistic motivation for this as well. And more people need to do it, so get onto it. If you were in the elevator and you were standing next to a relatively receptive billionaire um, who was sort of thinking about where to donate his money or where to invest his money, yeah. um, what would it be? How would you uh, say that elevator pitch to them? One or two minutes. Well, first of all, we're at the front end of a huge investment curve. I meant, uh, I, I said earlier on that this was like the internet dial-up phase. If you'd invested in the internet in the very early days, uh, you'd be more than a billionaire now. You'd be, you know, one of the richest people on the planet. Uh, we're at that stage now, so the opportunity for investors is huge. But you could do both. You could invest in something like the Sense Foundation or one of the Buck Institute or one of those wonderful organizations that's trying to advance the cause and at the same time, invest in some of the companies that come out of those institutions. So we've done two joint ventures with the Buck. We've done a couple of investments as a result of introductions by Sense Foundation, including the Organ Regeneration Program. So um, if you're a sensible billionaire, uh, you will be putting some of your money to work in a combination of the charitable enterprise that drives the science and the businesses themselves that come out of those enterprises. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. It's very nice to meet you. That, yeah. uh, near Buzz lies here. Uh, yeah. Do you know him, the Met Foreman fellow? Um, yeah, I'd really like. To. I don't know him, but yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, he's around. Yeah.